1983 was not a very good year for video games in North America. In fact, 1983 was almost the end of video games in North America in general. Not a good year. I'm talking, of course, about the video game crash of 1983. The ramifications of this crash wouldn't be fully felt until 1985. The lowest point of the event was in 85, but to keep things simple, I'm gonna cover the entire crash in this video. But what caused the crash? There were a number of factors at play. The two biggest factors were the sheer number of games, a lot of which were, uh, let's be polite about this, not good, as well as the number of consoles that were on the market. Too many games? Are you kidding? How is that a problem? I'll put it this way, Halo Combat Evolved was extremely popular, right? Now imagine if four or five versions of Halo Combat Evolved came out immediately after it, made by different developers for different consoles. GameCube, PlayStation 2, and Dreamcast versions of the game that only had minor differences, things like palette swaps or enemies with different names. That's what happened, but it was normal at the time. A popular game was released, and countless developers all released clones of the game to try and cash in on its popularity. There was also the problem of games that were just not very good, like E.T. the Extraterrestrial from 1982. It was a garbage game, but it was just the tip of the garbage iceberg. Another game like E.T. was the Atari 2600 port of Pac-Man. In arcades, Pac-Man was a monster, breaking in unprecedented amounts of money. Atari seized an opportunity. They released a version of the game for their home console, and people were getting f***ing hyped. Just imagine it, you could play Pac-Man in your living room. That's crazy. Atari produced upwards of 12 million copies of the game, which oddly enough was more than the number of Atari 2600 consoles at the time. Atari sold 7 million copies of the game, and it became the best-selling Atari 2600 game of all time. But fans were not happy. I, I don't even feel like describing it. Here's gameplay from the original Pac-Man, and here's gameplay from the 2600 version of it. Look at that. Think that Arkham Knight port was bad? This is what a bad port looks like. Back to the point though, a lot of games that were coming out were just bad. People could only get burned so many times on a bad game before they just gave up on gaming altogether. The other main cause of the crash was the number of consoles on the market. Atari had the 2600 and 5200 on the market. Keep in mind the 2600 was 6 years old at this point. Coleco had their ColecoVision. Magnavox had the Odyssey 2. Fairchild had the Fairchild Channel F2. Western Technologies had the Vectrex. Quick side note, I did forget to mention the Vectrex in the video for 1982, but I'm gonna mention it later on in this video. There were also lesser known consoles like the Entex Adventure Vision, Mattel Playgable, and Emerson Radio's Arcadia 2001. That's a lot of consoles. Which did you buy? How did you choose? At a certain point, too many choices becomes a problem. Another factor was also at play here, the rise of the home computer. Robert Jones said in the Gainesville Sunday paper from December 2nd, 1982, quote, The ultimate challenger for video games turf is the home computer, analysts say. In addition to playing games, home computers, which are in the same price range as game systems, can be used for educational, database retrieval, home financial calculations, and record keeping, end quote. He had a point. Oddly enough though, his point is still relevant today. Why buy a console when you can buy a computer at the same price that can do so much more? Yeah, consoles had their exclusive games, but if you picked one console, you were gonna miss out on a bunch of exclusives from other consoles anyway. An advantage of computers was that they were not only more powerful, but the games could be made on floppy disks, which meant you could actually be playing a game and then save your progress for later, because you could write to a floppy disk and then come back to it later. Those were the causes though. What about the effects? What happened as a result of this crash? There were multiple effects, one of which was the home video game genre, if you could call it that, was almost completely vanished. Seriously, it was bad. Compared to the revenue generated by home consoles in 1982, the revenue from 1985 was down over 95%, from over $3 billion to under $150 million. With game developers only making 5% of what they previously made, a lot of companies lost interest in the video game market. Magnavox was among them. They made the first home console, and now they're gone. Another result was stricter guidelines for third-party developers. Remember, when a popular game was released, a bunch of other developers would release clones of it. No longer would that be allowed. Console makers created lockout measures to ensure control over what games could be played on their systems, and that worked. There are other parts to this story, but this series is admittedly a bit bare-bones. Let's move on to some games from 1983. Actually, wait, let's backtrack a bit to the Vectrex, because I should have covered that in the last video. The Vectrex was created by Western Technologies and Smith Engineering and first released in 1982. The idea for the Vectrex came when John Ross from Smith Engineering and some other people went to a warehouse in Los Angeles. 
They saw some things that made them think that a game could be made of the components that they saw. The Vectrex, as the name suggests, used vector graphics, a feat at the time, as well as being the only home console to use them. How were vector graphics different from, say, pixel graphics? That's a good question. I don't know enough about either to tell you, so here's a quote from How To Geek about the differences. Quote, While pixels are literal blocks of an image simulating the points on your screen, vectors are points, lines, curves, and polygons on an algebraic grid. These points, lines, curves, and basic polygons are called primitives and are the basic building blocks of vector art. The important distinction between pixels and vectors is that vectors exist in mathematical space as opposed to the more literal space that pixels exist in. Pixels are all equal size and have clearly defined positions. Once you zoom in on a pixel, you are unlikely to find any quarks or tau particles inside. Vector primitives, existing only as points on a grid in this mathematical space, have no such limitation. You zoom in closer and closer to a point primitive in your vector image, you realize you can never really get any closer to it than you originally were." End quote. Back to the Vectrex, the system used colored sheets that could be overlaid on the system screen in order to give the graphics some color. The system was originally manufactured by General Consumer Electronics, but following a successful launch, Milton Bradley bought out GCE and started manufacturing the system themselves. That would be a big mistake, as the video game crash happened not long after Milton Bradley's acquisition. Milton Bradley eventually lost tens of millions of dollars over the Vectrex. That said, the system was a hit among gamers, and it still has a cult following today. As a result of the crash being this year, not many big games were released, with one exception. This is a big one. Mario Bros. is here. Realistically, I don't even need to talk about this game. Like, come on, we all know the impact this game had, but I'll talk about it anyway. Mario Bros. was first released on July 14th, 1983 in Japan. Mario Bros. was created by Shigeru Miyamoto and Gunpai Yogai, who had helped develop Donkey Kong. They designed a prototype game with multiple levels that they were eventually happy with. Not long after, Yogai suggested adding enemies to the game. Originally, the enemies would die after a single hit. But they found that that was too easy, so the enemies would require a second hit from below. That's how turtles were introduced into the series. Turtles would need to be hit from below, where they're vulnerable to get them to flip over to expose their weak spot. According to IGN's history of Super Mario Bros, Miyamoto felt that Mario should be a plumber instead of a carpenter because of his overalls and mustache. The game was already using pipes as a mechanic of the game, so it would make sense for Mario to become a plumber. Mario Bros. has the player take the role of Mario and Luigi as they venture down into the sewers to get rid of some weird creatures that have started appearing. The player gets points for eliminating enemies, and more points for eliminating them in quick succession. Points are also awarded for collecting coins. Despite the legacy of the Mario Bros. series as a whole, the original Mario Bros. wasn't really a hit in America, mostly because it was an arcade game released right when the video game crash started. It was ported to a wide variety of other systems, like many other arcade games of the time, but it wasn't really at the same level of a game like Pac-Man or Space Invaders. Still, it would spawn Super Mario Bros., and that game was in a league of its own. Between the video game Crash and Mario Bros, 1983 has been a hell of a year. Realistically, I could end the video right here, but I'm not. Let's cover a few more games first. Another Namco game is up next, Mappy, an arcade game first released on March 25th, 1983. In Mappy, the player takes the role of Mappy the Police Mouse, who must collect stolen items from within a mansion filled with cats. The player can only move by using an analog stick and open doors with a single button. There are six floors in the mansion, with trampolines letting you jump between floors. When Mappy comes in contact with the mouse, he dies. Mappy was a hit in Japan, but not in the United States. Still though, Mappy will get several more games over the years, with the most recent being Mappy World, released in September 2011 in Japan. In May 1983, Atari released Star Wars, a first-person space shooter arcade game that lets the player attack the Death Star as Luke Skywalker. Your goal is to destroy the Death Star, which takes three phrases. In the first, you fight in space and get into dogfights with enemy TIE fighters, and eventually Darth Vader. In the second, you destroy a laser turret on the surface of the Death Star. In the final phase, you make your way through the trenches of the Death Star and fire a torpedo into an exhaust port, destroying the Death Star. If you successfully destroy it, the game restarts with an increased difficulty. The game sold well and was praised by reviewers of the time, with many of them praising the digitized voices of the game. Lastly, I'm purposely leaving two things out of this video, Punch-Out and the Nintendo Entertainment System. 
I'm doing this for two reasons. One, this video is long enough as it is. If I include the NES, this video could easily be another four or five minutes long. Second, Punch-Out wouldn't be released in North America until 1984, and the NES wouldn't leave Japan until 1985. Considering the number of games that are being released in both those years, and what I've already covered in this video, I think it's fine for me to leave it out. And with that, we are done with 1983. Thank you for watching this part of the history of video games. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything with a like, leave a dislike. If you didn't enjoy the video or didn't learn anything, follow me on Twitter at Mitten Squad. My name is Paul of Mitten Squad. Have a wonderful day.